Hey folks, welcome to Wolfbane's Gaming Den. Today we're covering the tutorial for the game Maharaja, designed by Wolfgang Kramer and Michael Kiesling and published by Cranio Creations. Uh, this version of Maharaja is basically a reprint slash an updated version of a uh, what might be considered a classical uh, or a classic title, Maharaja, uh, designed of course by the famous uh, Kramer and Kiesling duo. Uh, this one features updated components uh, and updated artwork as well as some changes to the rules. So for the purposes of this tutorial, I'll run through how the setup works, how the rules work, uh, and at the very end, we'll cover some of the variants that the game comes with as well, so that I give you a flavor of uh, other means of playing the game as well. If you're looking for rules specific to the new reprint that came out in 2021, uh, this is definitely the right video for you. If you're looking for rules related to the older version of Maharaja, uh, this video will definitely give you sort of like a very good overview of how the rules work. But I should note that uh, there might be some differences in rules in this one versus the old version. Uh, so you might wanna be aware of that uh, if you're running through this. With that said, uh, let's crack into this one. Uh, now, in a game of Maharaja, basically, you will have... Maharaja basically means uh, king uh, of sorts on the Indian subcontinent, represented by that gray figure uh, over there. The Maharaja is going to be going over the different cities on the map over here, uh, these circular spots. And wherever he is at the end of a round is the city that gets scored. Uh, and your objective for the game is, of course, to get the most points during the course of the game as well as uh, near once we do the end game scoring as well. The way that you will do this is by building different uh, statues, which are denoted by these pieces, and different shrines, which are denoted by these pieces out in the board. And you will do this with the help of your priest, which is the guy that you have at the center of the board right now. So your priest is going to be moving around all over the board and will help you construct these shrines and statues all of the uh, all of the game board and that's how you're going to achieve most of your objectives for the game itself so let's start by looking at the components that we have laid out here uh, and then we'll go into the setup so this is obviously the main game board these are sort of like uh, bonus tiles that we have on the side over here these are character tiles these this is your personal player board where you will have your different pieces laid out and that of course is your action wheel right over here that you'll be using to select different actions on the game board so Let's start by looking at how setup works. So you will obviously take the main game board, put it out in the center area over here like so. Uh, it is a single-sided board, so we don't have to worry about what's on the other side. It's a nice piece of artwork, but nothing from a gameplay perspective. Uh, once you've got this thing laid out in the center, uh, you will do a few different things to it. So first of all, take the Maharani uh, token, which is basically this one. There's two of these in the game board, uh, in the game box, sorry. And you will put it in its designated spot over here. Uh, Next up, you will take these different flags, uh, and there is seven of them over here, uh, and you will randomly shuffle it and put it out in a sequence over here going from left to right. You will always leave two spaces blank on the very left-hand side. So you will start with the space that has a white black, uh, blank background going to the very right that also has a white blank background. Uh, these two spaces will be left empty. These spaces we won't worry about for now. They will basically come into play as we go through the different rounds in the game. Next, you will take these uh, bonus tiles and you will lay these out over here uh, vertically going from bottom, uh, the very bottom most spot, all the way sort of like as top as you can. Uh, four of these are going to be empty and that's fine. Uh, you're not supposed to fill up all of these. So just go from bottom to top over here uh, for now. Uh, next, lay down all the sort of like the other pieces that the game comes with. So for example, we have our prestige tokens, which we've put in this container over here. We have our coins, and I'm using metal coins, which are upgraded from the Kickstarter uh, version that was delivered in here. But if you're using the cardboard ones, uh, goes without saying, they function pretty much the same way. So take all your coins and put it on a uh, to the side over here. And then lastly, you have these action tokens, which look like sort of like uh, uh, tokens with bird symbols on it. So uh, put these to the side as well. Next up, you will take these character tiles and you're gonna take a number equal to the number of players plus three. So in this uh, example, we're gonna set up for a three player game. So we're gonna take three for the three players and then three extra ones. There's gonna be a bunch of these left over. They basically get put back in the box and that's fine. Uh, once you've taken six characters, lay them out in front of everybody for now. We'll come back to this in a, in a, uh, in a minute or so. Next up, each player takes a player board. Uh, and this is basically this player board right mat over here. 
they will take 15 coins which will go on this uh, side left hand side denoted by the coin symbol they will take three prestige points which will go on this side over here the one thing that i'll quickly call out about the prestige points are these are uh, the points values printed on one side and not the other so as whenever you have it on your game board you can always flip it face down because prestige is meant to be private information from your competitors so you want to maybe hide these i mean obviously at the start of the game everybody knows it's three each but uh you can hide them over the course of the game uh this is where your character tile, character tile will go and we'll come back to, uh, to this in a minute uh next up these are your shrine tokens you will take eight of them put it in this area this is where you have all your available shrines located the other shrines will go off to the side of the board uh there will be certain actions that will allow you to bring some of these on and we'll look at that later on uh, then take all your statues and there's seven of them and you will put them down on their designated spot like this uh, next up you will take one of the action wheels that the game comes with uh, and you're going to put it over here uh, thematically or artistically you're supposed to put it on this side of the game board because you can see that uh, circular engraving uh, with the arc and that shape over there but because of space constraints we're just going to lay it off to the side for now uh, and with that said, that's more or less the setup done at this point. Uh, the Maharaja token, uh, we're not going to worry about this just yet. We're going to put it off to the side. Uh, this guy is going to start off on the center of the board as well. Now, there are some variants that the game comes with that will flip the scoring uh, and sort of like some of the cost for these. Uh, we're not going to use this for the purposes of this rules explanation, but we'll have a look at this at the end of the video. And we'll also talk about some of the differences for... Uh, uh, actions around the two player count uh, when and as we come across those they're minor so hopefully we can cover them as we go through the rules of the game itself and with that said we're pretty much set up for uh, a game of maharaja so in this example we're setting it up for three players so there's a few items you have to do before you start taking your first turn each player will take uh, their priest tokens which are denoted by this uh, shape symbol over here so here we're playing with uh, blue color ourselves but we're saying that red and yellow are in the game as well each priest token for the players in play will basically go to the very center location of the game board which is denoted by this space over here uh, next you will randomly choose a start player uh, and i use the word start player loosely because the sequence is going to change right away uh, but you will choose somebody to start and then that player will choose one of these tiles uh, character tiles uh, from the game board uh, from the uh, the area over here so for example let's say if i was the starting player i might have a look at these and maybe i like the idea of this one so perhaps i will keep this one in front of me like this uh, it then continues in clockwise order so somebody else may have a look at this and think this is something they want uh, they'll pick this up and then somebody else may think this is something they want and then they will pick that up and then we're going to be left with three of these and these will remain uh, uh, in front of everybody because there will be an opportunity to swap these out over the course of the game so do not throw them back in the box just yet uh, and then once you're done with that uh, the next thing you want to keep in mind is uh, the number on these character tiles. Now, this number basically tells you the turn order uh, that you're playing with. Uh, lower numbers always start before higher numbers. So in this example, if I had chosen something that had a number seven, and we had said that the other two players had chosen number one and four, so whoever picked number one is the first player in turn order, uh, four is the second player in turn order, and then seven, uh, basically myself, I am the last player in turn order over here. So this will determine the initiative order uh, over the course of the game. Then starting with the lowest initiative order, so in this case, this would be the character that uh, the player that has the one tile, they will start putting their shrine uh, markers out on the board. And then you're going from low initiative order to high order. Uh, you will put out four shrines uh, in different villages. And this is a good time to have a look at some of the spots in the uh, board itself. Uh, so these were said were sort of like the main cities uh, or, or towns over the map, but you will see that these are connected by different pathways. And on each of the pathways, uh, there's a small village, well, two villages rather, uh, in between any two cities that you might wanna, or any two locations that you might wanna have a look at. Uh, these are villages and each village will have available spots for two different shrines to go in there. So starting with 
uh, the player with the lowest initiative, uh, lowest number going all the way to high, they will put down their shrine markers out on the board. The key rule that you want to follow when putting these shrine markers in the different villages is that you cannot have both of your shrines in the same village uh, at any point in the game. So uh, red, for example, could potentially have their, uh, maybe we'll just fast forward very quickly uh, to what a final setup looks like, but let's say red maybe uh, did their setup like this. Uh, and then yellow perhaps had done their setup uh, something similar uh, to this. Uh, we'll do some live setup for demonstration purposes right now. Uh, so maybe this is what yellow had done. And then of course, uh, this I'll quickly call out is not coming in from the reserve. This is coming in from this area on the player board. So once you've put out your four uh, shrines for the starting setup, you will be left with four in this particular area. So in our case, we can possibly go to a few spots where somebody else already has a shrine. So now nobody else can go in here because there's a max spots of two and that's already been taken. Uh, and then we could go to some place that's new. Uh, where else can we go? Maybe we want to go here. Maybe we want to go here. And now I've just randomly placed these out, but obviously when you're doing it, there's going to be a little bit more strategy behind it. Once I've gone through the rules for the game, that will make a lot more sense to you guys. But for now, uh, what you're doing is you're going in turn order and placing out four shrines each on the game board itself. And with that said, uh, that's more or less done. Uh, we just have to now put down the Maharaja on the starting spot. And that is going to be the flag that's on the leftmost area over here. So that's the green city. And so the Maharaja is going to go to the city over here. So we're just gonna put him off a little bit to the side just so that we can see uh, the rest of the area as well because we'll play some examples over there. Uh, once you've done that, this flag now moves over all the way to the right. Uh, and then this order is now updated. And with that, now we're finally done and ready to get started with the game. Uh, so in this game, we're building out different statues, different shrines, uh, and we'll be using our priest to travel around and do those different actions for us on the game board. Uh, and that's how we want to have different points. Uh, the game will take place over seven rounds. Uh, so that's denoted by these seven over here. Uh, the game can also end before the seven rounds is done. And the way that that can happen is if somebody completes their seventh statue, uh, before we get to the seven rounds, uh, that round basically becomes the very last round in the game. So we finish up that round uh, and then we basically do end game scoring as if it were the last one. So if somebody's completed their seventh in uh, the sixth round, it's basically a sixth round game at that point. Uh, but of course, if it's completed in the seventh round, you're still doing the full seven rounds. And if nobody completes their seven statues in seven rounds, you still end at the end of the seventh round. So that's your end game trigger our objective in there. So now, how does the game work? Uh, as you're playing the game of Maharaja, uh, you'll be going through a few different steps. Uh, before I come into the steps, let's quickly walk through some key concepts in the game. Uh, so there's a few different key things that you can do, and there's some good reminders on the game board for that. So whenever you're building a statue or a shrine, it has to be on a location where your priest is available at. So if I wanted to build a statue or a shrine uh, in this particular city over here, my priest must be in this spot right here. Now, if he's already there, then that's fine. Uh, but it is possible that he may have to move over there for me to be able to do that action on that spot. Moving your priest all over the board is uh, free. Basically, it's a free action. Uh, you don't have to take an extra action to be able to do that but you might have to pay a certain cost associated with it. And you also have to make sure that you can make a legal move to that particular spot. So let's say for example, if I started off from here and my priest is here, which we will in the sort of like the very first turn order, and I wanted to build something here, this blue priest needs to come over here. The way that we can ensure that he can do that is if the villages that he has to go through have at least one shrine in them. So in this case, there is at least one shrine here and there is at least one shrine here. So legally, the priest can now move over here. But because none of these shrines are his, so none of the blue shrines are basically this location, uh, he would have to pay a cost as he does that move. For each other player's shrine that he's moving through, he would have to pay one coin to those players. So in this example, he has to pay one coin to yellow and then one coin to red. Now, if for example, I had, instead of putting my shrine over here, I had done 
uh, one shrine over here and I wanted to do the same move. I would have to pay yellow because yellow still has the only shrine in this area, but I do have a shrine there. So I do not need to pay red anymore. So going from here to here would then cost me just the one coin. So that's the key thing you want to keep in mind with the uh, movement for the priests are concerned. Oh, and before I forget, uh, of course, you need to have shrines on both the villages on that path. So if you don't have that, you cannot legally make that move. So if I wanted to go from here to this city following this path, uh, there's a shrine on one of the two villages, but this one does not have any shrines on it. So I technically cannot move over here until somebody builds a shrine in that particular spot over there. So those are the key things you want to keep in mind as far as moving your priest are concerned. <laughs> the next thing you want to be aware of is uh, the cost associated with building uh, shrines or statues. So if you're ever building a statue and you're building it on a city that the Maharaja is already in, that's going to cost you 12 coin. And if you're building it on any other city on the game board, that's, that will cost you 10 coins. And the way that you can remember that is through this area printed over here. So this very easily tells you uh, with the elephant symbol and the statue over here that if you're building it in an area with the Maharaja, that costs you 12. Anywhere else, that costs you 10. So that's the cost associated with building a statue. And when you're building a statue, uh, there are different spots in the city that it can go to. There's a total of seven spots it can go to. Uh, one spot is a central location over here. So that's basically this area. Each city will have one. And then there is six uh, spots, rectangular shapes that you can see going around uh, that central area. So seven spots in total in each city that you can build a statue out to. Uh, building in the central area uh, costs you the same as building it out here. It does not give you any benefit, uh, but it will score you higher worship points when it comes to scoring. We'll have a look at how that works. But some of these other spots will actually give you bonuses when you build over them. And we can see here, this gives you a bonus for building a statue over here, which you will take right away. And then this gives you a, a bonus for building a statue over here. These other four spots do not give you any bonuses for building statues over there. So for most of the game, you will actually see, you know, a lot of competition for starting with these three spots for building statues and then going over to these once these other spots are basically taken over. Because that's, you know, this gets you more worship points. These gets you immediate bonuses. So you want to aim for these before you go for the other spots in there. So that's where you can build a statue and then you can take that benefit right away. So it can be as simple as like uh, something like this, which is take two coin and one prestige point. Or it could be something like this, which says you can build shrines uh, on a particular location. And uh, the rule book basically has a section where it walks you through some of these symbologies. You can always refer to that to figure out the benefit if it's not immediately obvious to you. So that's building a statue. And like I said earlier, you need to have your priest in the spot you're building the statue in. So that's very critical for you to keep an eye on. The next thing that you can build is, of course, the shrine. Uh, and if we continue looking at this section over here, this reminds you that to build a shrine is going to cost you one coin. Again, you need to have your priest in the city that you're building the shrine in. That is mandatory. You cannot build it elsewhere. Uh, and when you're building a... Uh, shrine. You can build it in, of course, one of two locations. The first one we've already seen. So you can always build a shrine on any one of the villages. And if you're building it in the village, uh, they can be anywhere on the game board. Doesn't matter where your priest is at that point. So I could just build my shrine over here and that's perfectly legal. Whenever I'm building a shrine, they will, of course, come from this area over here. If I want to build my shrine in a city, that's where I have to go. If you can see, there's a thick circular area around the city over here, and you're basically building in that thick circular area. Uh, so, and when you're building it here, it will cost you the one money. Uh, well, the one money is basically applicable even if you're building it here or here, but you don't need the priest for this. You do need the priest for this. Uh, and basically it can go over here. Uh, any number of shrines can be accommodated in a particular uh, city as it were. So we'll bring this back like so. Uh, all right, so that's basically uh, the rules around building shrines, moving your priests around the board and building statues. The last thing I'll quickly call out is you will, uh, there's gonna be seven scoring that takes place uh, over the course of the game based on where the Maharaja is and based on sort of like the strap over here. Uh, and we'll have a look at this at the very end. So for now, know that there is scoring taking place on this section of the board. 
that we'll come to in maybe a few minutes and it will make more sense then. So those are most of the key concepts in the game. Now, how, what actions are you taking over the course of the game yourself, you might ask. And assuming you understood the key concepts, uh, the actions now will be very easy and simple for you to understand, hopefully. Uh, so the game will take place over a few different uh, phases uh, in each of the seven rounds, if it goes up to the seven rounds. Uh, in the first phase, the Maharaja is gonna move. So basically that's, we've already completed for our first round. We basically looked at the very leftmost flag symbol over here, put the Maharaja in that particular spot, and then we move that to the rightmost available spot over here. So job done, first phase, uh, Maharaja's made his move. Uh, in the next phase, we're basically going to plan using our action wheel, and this will take place in secret. So uh, for example, I might be looking at this, and you will. it's a good time to have a look at the action wheel itself. Uh, there are two hands on here, which you will use to select two actions. So over the course of the game, you're basically, for the most part, taking two actions every round. Uh, if you wanted, you could use both hands to point at the same action, and that basically means you can take the same action twice. That is legal. Uh, if for any reason you're unable to take the action that you've chosen, uh, you can still complete it partially. So for example, if I had taken this action, which means build a statue and build a shrine, uh, but I don't have enough money to do both of these, I could do you know, one of the two and then do the other action. Uh, between the two actions, I can always choose also choose the sequence I do it in. So I, I am the only one who can say, I'm going to do this one first and then this one or vice versa. That's, that's up to me, the active player at that point. So in this planning phase, we're basically looking at our own action dials and choosing the two actions that we may want to do. Uh, and once we have chosen, we're going to put it face down in front of us. Uh, and everybody will do the same thing. And once everybody's put their action dials face down in front of them, that's the end of the planning phase right there. Uh, that basically is, you cannot change your uh, sort of like choices at that point. The next thing that you will do is everybody's gonna flip it over. And going in turn order, again, going by sort of like the sequence uh, on your character card over here. So starting with one in this example, then four, then seven, uh, each player will then start resolving both of their actions together. The way that this will work is, uh, so let's say in this case, one and four had already done their actions and maybe I want to get into it and do my stuff over here. So let's look at what all the different actions are. Uh, and maybe we'll start with the easy ones and then work our way up. So this one, for example, if you had chosen this action, uh, this is one of the easier ones you can obviously do. This basically simply says, take three money. So if I were to do this, I would take three money from the supply over here. So one, uh, two, and a three and I'm going to put this down on my money section and I'm done. So that's, that's an easy enough action, right? Uh, next up, let's have a look at this action over here. So what this action basically tells you is you can turn in three money to get two points. So it's one good way uh, to convert money into points. Uh, might even be handy near the end of the game or if you have some money but not enough to really do anything. So I could give out three money from here back into the supply and I will take up two prestige points uh, from over here and put them uh, face down in that particular spot over there. That's the other action right there. Uh, which one do we want to have a look at next? Let's start with this. So this basically tells you that you can build a statue, uh, but at a discount of one. So if you're basically building a statue in a city where the Maharaja is, if you remember, that generally costs 12. Any other city, that will generally cost you 10. If you're use, building a, a statue using this particular action over here, you get a discount of one. So building it in a city where the Maharaja is now costs you 11. Building it in any other city now costs you nine. So easy enough. Uh, let's have a look at this action. This is basically telling you that you can build a statue and you can build a shrine. So you can build again, uh, but you're not getting any discounts. You can do more builds using this action, but you're paying the full price at this particular point. Uh, we already had a look at this one. Uh, next up, this basically tells you that you can take two shrines from your reserve and put it in your active supply. So if you were to choose this action, you can take two shrines from over here, your reserve, and you will put it in your active supply right over there. So that's the key action that you will use to take some of these and bring them out over here. There are also spots on the board that give you some of these benefits. So this one, if you remember, we had a look at earlier on. This is the same action. Take two from here and put it in your active supply right over there. So that's, uh, where were we? This action that you could basically take care of. 
we already had a look at this. Let's look at this one. <coughs> Excuse me. This basically tells you that you can build two shrines on the game board uh, with the caveat that at least one of the shrines must be in a city. So you can build both your shrines in, a, uh, in cities. You can build one shrine in a city, one shrine in a village, but you cannot build both shrines in villages. That's your limitation right there. And of course, if you remember, uh, to build a shrine in a city, you need to have your priest in there. So you still need to follow that rule. This action tells you that you can build a shrine, but at a discount of one. And this is interesting because if you remember, building shrines basically cost you, ever cost you one money or one coin. So at a discount of one basically means you're building it for free at that point. All you have to do is just make sure the priest is there if it's in a city uh, or if it's in a village, then you know, you're know you basically just putting it down for free at that point. Uh, this one is a little interesting. So this basically tells you, uh, and I'm just gonna make sure that this is focused in properly, that you can move a flag marker three spaces back. Now, let's come back to this flag track right over here. So what this basically is telling us is you can take any one of these and move it three spaces back. And the reason why you would want to do that is because you might find yourself in a position where a certain city is getting scored. It's not to your benefit. Maybe you want to change that up or you want certain cities to get scored right away or, you know, the next one coming up, uh, it's up to you to choose. So the way that you can do this is, so let's say if I wanted the pink city to be scored right away instead of the green, because I've not really done a lot on green, but I have done some on pink. I could take this, move it three spaces back. So I'm going to move it one, two, three, and this will come and occupy this spot right here. I'm not going to slide all of these immediately. Uh, that happens at the end of the round, uh, but I would choose to do this right away. And now perhaps I've messed up the plans for my opponents or I've set myself up for perhaps scoring a lot of points with red or whatever my objective might be based on that particular move. But that's basically what you're doing. If you were to move it onto a spot where there is an existing flag, uh, that flag and everything to its left will get shifted, uh, sorry, everything to its right will then get shifted in that direction. So if I were to take this one and I wanted to move it three spaces, so one, two, three, obviously there's a yellow flag right over here. So this guy is gonna get bumped forward like this, like so. Uh, interestingly enough, if I wanted to move uh, something like this back three spaces, I would still do one, two, three, but I would put it over here and I would leave the gaps as it were, wherever it may be. Uh, because remember, uh, not I'm not the only one who can take this action on my turn. Other players can as well. So empty spaces at the end of this action is perfectly normal and fine as it were. Uh, this will only get resolved at the end of the round. So, you know, you might you might be tempted to basically slide all of these because, uh, you know, instinctively that's what we might do in most games. But in this one, uh, leave it blank as, it, uh, as it's applicable. So that's basically shifting the flags back three spaces. Uh, and then this one basically tells you that you can swap your character tile. Now, uh, we already have one from the start of the game, but you're not really stuck with it for the rest of the game. If you were to choose this action, you can swap your character tile with any tile in the reserve over here. So that's mainly why we still have these out right here. Or you can actually swap it with any one of your opponents as well. So I could basically take this one, uh, put it back in the supply, uh, and I'm always putting it back in the supply no matter where I take it from. And I could perhaps take uh, this one. Or I could perhaps, you know, be like, well, I'm always going last compared to everybody else. I want to take the one because I, you know, I'm tired of that. I want to go before everybody else does, and I can just take this. But now what this means is that your opponent is now short one character tile. So immediately, as soon as you've taken that turn, your opponent has the option to pick up a character tile from the general supply over here. So he might look at this and say, you know what, I'm going to pick up the uh, nine because the nine looks good for me for whatever reason. And then they can pick it up right over there. So that's basically your action right over here. You're basically swapping your tile out with one from the supply over here or one from one of your opponents. And if you take something from your opponent, then they get to choose one from the supply right away. Uh, so everybody basically has one in their turn. Uh, the interesting thing about this action also is because some of these give you sort of like an action or some sort of an ongoing ability. If it's an action, you can take the action before doing the swap 
take the new character tile and if the new character tile allows you to do another action, you can take that action right away. So it is perfectly legal for you to benefit from the one that's outgoing and the one from that uh, and the one that's incoming in the same round. Assuming, of course, you can time it in that way. And hopefully, now that we went through the sort of like the starting concepts and we went through these different actions right after that, these actions now make a lot of sense to you guys. The one other thing I'll quickly point out at this point is the game, if you remember, we had said also came with these different action tokens. Uh, the way that this action token work is, and some of the spots on the game board will give you these action tokens. So if you ever have these or, you know, certain characters might give you action tokens, uh, you will, this is uh, something that you can now spend on your turn in addition to the two actions that you took. So the way that that will work is once I've done my set of two actions, I can spend one action token if I have it, uh, putting it back in the supply and I can take any one action from this whole selection uh, for free. So I can just pretend as if I had a third full action and I can choose any which one I want at that point and take it. That must of course be the third action that you're taking on your turn. Uh, the one limitation to that rule is that you cannot take the action uh, that allows you to flip character uh, tiles out over here. So that's the one limitation that you have. You can't take that uh, additional action and swap your character out, uh, but you can do any one of the other actions uh, on that particular time. Uh, and that's it. That's basically how the action phase will work, which is where a lot of the meat of the game uh, basically resides. Once you're done with the action phase, you then move on to the city scoring phase. Uh, the city scoring phase is, again, uh, denoted by this section over here. So if you remember, we had said, keep this in mind. So now this is a good time to come to it. So let's have a look at this one. This tells you that based on what you have in the city that is getting scored right now, uh, you will basically uh, score points based on that. So let's maybe put some of uh, these things out uh, so that we can maybe make an example. So let's say if I had one shrine uh, out of the center over here uh, and I had another, uh, sorry, statue out over here and maybe I had another statue out in here and perhaps I had uh, one shrine and then my priest was hanging around here as well. And that's the city that we're scoring at the end of this one. The way that it will work is uh, you will score worship points based on what you have in the city that's getting scored. So what this is telling you is that for each statue in the central location, so that's this one right over here, you will score three worship points. Uh, you're not getting any physical components for the worship points. It's, you just have to add them up and remember the total. Uh, for every other statue in the city, so that's this one over here, uh, you will score two worship points. Uh, for every shrine in the city, you will score one point. And for your priest in the city, if the priest is there, you will score one worship point. So in this case, I'm getting three points for this, uh, two points for this, one and one for each of these. So that's five plus two, seven. So I'm getting seven worship points from that city. Now let's say, for example, maybe uh, my uh, opponent, this guy had maybe uh, uh, eight uh, points from the city and then maybe he had three points from the city uh, so he's first I'm second this player is third uh, we will now come back to this table and have a look at uh, what we're getting based on the ranking that we're at so the player that has the most uh, we will look at the appropriate uh, row for the player count so given the fact that this is a three player game uh, this is for two players this is for three players this is for four players so we're only concerned with this row over here the player that has the most worship points will now get 12 money from the supply. The player that has the second most gets nine and the player that has the third most basically gets six money from the supply. So this is a good way to build up replenish your money supply so that you can in future turns put down more shrines, put down more uh, statues, move your priests more and so on and so forth. If by any chance you don't have anything in that city, uh, you still get three money as a consolation prize. Uh, the one difference between the consolation prize and the actual prizes is that as long as you have something scored from that city, you will pick up one of these bonus styles as well, which if you don't have anything from there, uh, you actually don't. So if you're not scoring anything from that city, you just get the three money, you don't get any of these. But as long as you're scoring something, you will pick up something from here. Uh, I'm gonna move these to the side so that we can have a quick look at this. So. This was put out here and it was randomly put out. But if we look at the side, you will see that uh, some of these have a null, like a, a crossed out symbol. And then others have 
clear counts shown over here. What this tells you uh, is that the bottom two ones that don't have any symbol, uh, you can always access these two bonuses. The next one says you can access this if you're playing a one player game. So if you're playing a solo game, you can access this one as well. So you can, if you're playing a solo game and you're supposed to pick up one of these benefits, you can choose from these three. If you're playing a two player game and you can uh, sort of like, you know, if you're picking up one of the benefits, you can pick up from this one. <coughs> Excuse me. And then for four, you're picking it up from, uh, for three, you're not picking it up from this one. Uh, and then whenever you've picked up a benefit, so I might, for example, pick up something like this, uh, whichever one you've picked up will now move on to the very top of this row over here. And then maybe the next player comes in and they pick up this, and then this moves in to the very top over here, like so. Uh, whatever blank is left will be left over here, uh, as it were. So only a certain number of uh, tiles at the very bottom section are any at any point available uh, for players to pick up uh, from here. Uh, the benefits are usually immediately, so you'll basically just take the immediate benefit uh, that this gives you. Again, the end of the rule book does go through detail over all of these symbologies. Uh, you know, so you might get something like just straight up money, you might get an extra action token uh, or other benefits uh, over the course of the game by picking these up as well. Uh, and that's pretty much the end of the city scoring. So you're basically scoring money based on this table over here, and then you're picking up benefits from here as long as you've scored something from that city. Uh, as it were. Once you're done with the city scoring phase, you're basically now moving on to the end of round phase. And this is where we do some of our cleanup action. So if you remember, if we had gaps, uh, you know, in our flag track like this, this is when you're pushing everything out uh, to the right, making sure that everything's now covered up. And same thing over here, uh, we will now push all of these down so that this is now uh, in a sequence where, you know, you're covering up everything from the bottom all the way to as high as it uh, is supposed to go on that rack. And that's basically how a round of Maharaja will work. You're basically doing this seven times. Uh, and uh, at the end of the seventh round, the game will end and you'll do end game scoring. Unless, as I mentioned earlier, of course, if somebody's built their seventh city uh, earlier on, in which case you then score uh, the game at the end of that round. So let's look at how end game scoring works. For end game scoring, we'll basically look at this section right over here. This tells us how much prestige points we're scoring based on what we have accomplished over the course of the game. Uh, so in addition to the prestige points that you would have collected uh, in between the game itself, which are all gonna be in this spot over here, you will score three prestige points for each statue that you've built, one prestige point for each money or coin that you have left over at the end of the game. Uh, you don't round up uh, in any way for this one, so you must have the full amount for you to get the prestige point. And then lastly, you're getting two prestige points uh, for each city that you have the most worship points in. So again, you look at the different cities based on this parameter over here to see who has the most worship points in each of the city. For each one that you're leaving in, you will score two prestige points and you'll pick up the corresponding prestige point tokens from here. Uh, at the start of the end game scoring, uh, whatever character tiles that you have are returned back into the supply. So sequencing from there no longer helps you. Over the course of the main game itself, uh, if you're ever tied, this acts as a tiebreaker uh, in favor of the player with the lower uh, numbered uh, tile. But for end game scoring, this doesn't help you out in any which way. Uh, so basically what will happen is if you're ever tied for the first position in any one city, uh, each tied player are basically going to collect one prestige point each. Take all the different points that you get from, you know, what you're already collected, plus whatever you're getting at the end of the game using that table. And then whoever has the most points wins. If you're still tied for points uh, after tallying up all of them, uh, ties are broken in favor of the player who has the most statues. If there's still a tie at that point, uh, the player with the most coins wins. And if there's still a tie right after that, then all the tied players share the victory at that point. Now, the game also comes with a bunch of components that help you uh, play a different kind of variants of the game itself. Uh, I'm not going to go through all of these, but I'm going to just introduce these different components to you uh, and help you understand how they work. And hopefully that should be sufficient for you to be able to take them uh, and mix and match based on your own preference. So one of the variants that the game comes with is uh, new tiles for this particular spot over here. And what that does is it really changes up how end game scoring works. 
So for example, uh, you have all of these different tiles, which I have some from the Kickstarter version, uh, which are uh, extras that you may not get in the retail box, but the regular retail version will have a whole bunch of these that come in there as well. And as you can see, uh, you will score points based on different conditions over here. So if you look at a quick example, uh, you see that you get two points uh, per each statue that you have, uh, two points for each one that you're leading, one point for every five points that you have. So this is similar to that except for this points, but now you also get two additional points for each uh, statue that you have at the center city spot. Uh, this one gives you points for shrines as well. This one gets you uh, points for having five or more uh, points in a particular city and then so on and so forth. There's a quite a bit of variability with these. So you can mix and match uh, should, you know, if that is something that you want to try it out. Uh, there's a bunch of options that you have available. Uh, the next kind of tiles that you get in the game that you can also mix and match are these. Uh, and these can basically be used in these spots so that the way that you score worship points for a particular city can be varied up. So again, uh, it adds a little bit of variability to that as well. And then lastly, you have uh, some of these tiles over here. And then these can go in these spots uh, and they can really change how some costs associated with different uh, spots may look like. So, uh, you know, I'm going to leave this for you to discover on your own. Uh, but it is there uh, for you to try out. So, you know, uh, the appendix does go through this in the rule book. Once you've played a couple of games and you're familiar with it, I highly recommend giving these a go. Uh, and hopefully that will help you vary the game uh, to quite a, bit of a, uh, quite a bit of an extent. The last thing I'll quickly call out is that the game also comes with a solo version uh, called the Brahmabot, if I'm pronouncing it correctly. Uh, and what that basically means is, of course, that you're playing solo and uh, you're basically playing against an AI bot. And you do get a bunch of components in the base game box that cover that. So uh, these tiles, for example, are specific to the solo version. So if you're wondering why you have not seen these in my explanation so far, that's the reason. That's for the solo version right there. Uh, the game also comes with these tiles uh, as well. And these are also related to the solo version. So these are you know, ways in which the Brahma bot is basically going to be taking actions over the course of the game. Uh, I think. I've not played the solo version, so I'm not really sure how that works uh, in full detail. But uh, if it's something that's of interest to you, it is in the rule book. Do try it out. Uh, but otherwise, that's it. That's the rules for Maharaja. Uh, hopefully, uh, this video helps you guys understand the rules in a bit more detail and the examples uh, help make things a little bit clearer uh, without, you know, uh, playing your first game as it were. And hopefully this also helps you get the game to the table a little bit faster. So if you did enjoy the video, uh, do give us a like and subscribe to our channel. Uh, and in the meanwhile, thanks for watching and I will see you at the next one. Take care.